The Subcommittee on Research and Science Education will come to order. Uh, good morning. Welcome to today's hearing entitled An Overview of the National Science Foundation Budget for Fiscal Year 2013. The purpose of today's hearing is to examine the administration's proposed fiscal year 2013 budget request for the National Science Foundation. I now recognize myself, uh, recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. I am pleased to welcome Dr. Suresh and Dr. Bowen to discuss NSS priority for fiscal year 2013. Before I hear from them, I would like to make a few comments concerning the President's proposed FY 2013 budget. From where I sit, the President's FY 2013 budget is an irresponsible, pie-in-the-sky wish list that fails to take into account America's deteriorating financial condition and seeks to pay for programs with money America simply does not have. Let me explain. America faces what may be its greatest financial threat in its history. In FY 2011, America's revenues were $2.3 trillion and our spending was $3.6 trillion, yielding a $1.3 trillion de deficit. Stated differently, 36 cents of every dollar spent by America in FY 2011 was borrowed money. Under the President's guidance, America has, for the first time ever, run three consecutive trillion dollar plus deficits. Last November, America's accumulated debt blew through the $15 trillion mark. Sometime this year, America's accumulated debt will blow through the $16 trillion mark. Now, if you're like most folks, it's hard to grasp numbers that are in the trillions. Let me simplify the trillions for a moment. Imagine a family that has not been paying attention to its finances and is starting to feel insecure about where they are. The mom and dad sit at the dinner table and go over their finances for the past three years. They tally up their average income and discover they have been earning $50,000 per year for each of those three years. They feel pretty good about that. Then they get to the expense side of the ledger. They add up their bills and expenses and discover that they have average spending $80,000 per year for three years. Stated differently, they have been losing $30,000 per year for each of those three years. This $30,000 per year annual deficit would cause most families to shudder. They would worry about whether their house will be foreclosed or their cars repossessed. They would worry about whether they can avoid bankruptcy. As that husband and wife struggle with where to cut spending or whether one of them can get another job or work overtime, the wife picks up the visa bill. She opens it. It is a bill for $320,000. Now imagine how overwhelmed that couple must feel, how hopeless the situation may seem. Well, those numbers, $50,000 per year in income, $80,000 a year in expenses, and $320,000 in accumulated debt mirror the ratios of America's $2.3 trillion income, $3.6 trillion in expenses, and $15 trillion in debt. All America is is one very large family of 311 million citizens. The only substantive difference between the hypothetical family I just gave you and America is one of size. Yet the impact of an American insolvency and bankruptcy will have much greater catastrophic effects on all American citizens. Which brings me to the President's proposed FY 2013 budget. It does absolutely nothing to alleviate that threat or minimize the risk of an American insolvency or bankruptcy. Rather than cutting spending, the President proposes to increase spending by over $200 billion to $3.8 trillion, or nearly a quarter of our gross domestic product, roughly 23.3%. Under this President's budget, America's gross national debt will increase from $15 trillion today to $26 trillion 10 years from now, and this accumulated debt includes taking into account the President's proposal for the largest tax increase in U.S. history. The President's FY 2013 budget is simply not sustainable. It is not responsible. It is more of the same. It places America's future at risk. All of which brings us to today's hearing. America must figure out a way to better prioritize and leverage our precious and limited federal dollars. Today we'll be examining the President's FY 2013 budget request for the National Science Foundation, which totals $7.4 billion, an increase of $340 million, or 4.8 percent, over the FY 2012 estimate. While my colleagues and I disagree, excuse me, may disagree on the best priorities for federal research dollars, I am sure that we can all agree that support for basic research is important and essential to our economy. 
Basic research is an investment in America's future. It is a productive job creator. The fruits of that research create jobs and opportunities that oftentimes change our lives, but even this important endeavor must be undertaken in a fiscally responsible way in our current economic climate. Through what many consider the gold standard of merit review processes, the NSF has played a vital role in funding basic research crucial to the economic security and international competitiveness of the United States for over 60 years now. As most in this room know, the National Science Foundation is the primary source of federal government support for non-health-related research and development at America's colleges and universities. The administration's budget request for NSF focuses on fostering the development of a clean energy economy, supporting future job creation through advanced manufacturing and emerging technologies, protecting critical infrastructure, promoting multidisciplinary research in new materials, wireless communications, cyber infrastructure, and robotics, developing the next generation of scientific leaders through support for graduate fellowships and early career faculty, and advancing evidence-based reforms in science and mathematics education. While a nearly 5% increase for NSF and in FY2013 shows stronger fiscal restraint than the FY2012 request at 13%, I remain concerned that our federal agencies still are not doing enough to encourage austerity and properly prioritize scarcer federal funds. It is the job of every member on this subcommittee to ensure that all federal investments serve to strengthen the economy. It is my hope that together we can work to achieve this goal while at the same time exhibiting fiscal accountability. NSF has a long and proven track record, one in which we are all proud, and I have every reason to believe NSF will continue this good work with whatever budgets are forthcoming from Congress. I look forward to hearing the testimony to be presented today and thank both of you gentlemen for taking the time out of your very busy schedules to join us. The chair now recognizes Mr. Lipinski for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Brooks. Uh, and I want to welcome back Dr. Thresh and uh, Dr. Bowen. Uh, and certainly, as uh, the chairman said, in this challenging fiscal environment, it's our job to make tough choices and set priorities. I feel strongly we need to prioritize investments that deliver real returns to taxpayers and boost our economic competitiveness. As the chairman says, this is, uh, the NSF certainly is a, a place that, uh, that that happens. As a result, I'm pleased that the administration's FY13 budget request continues to emphasize science, innovation, and STEM education generally, and the National Science Foundation in particular. But I think it's also important for me to urge everyone to be realistic about the notion of doubling the NSF's budget and focus instead on maintaining a sustainable, predictable path of growth. While I do think that doubling funding would yield enormous dividends for our country, I think that we should all recognize that aspirations that ignore the reality of our budget deficit are not particularly helpful to the agencies or agency or to the scientific community. Predictability will help our research institutions to plan while helping our scientists avoid the booms and busts that have driven some of our brightest minds out of the lab. In my view, the President's FY13 request for the NSF strikes a good balance. I have a few comments on specific programs and proposed activities. First, I'm very excited to see the proposed expansion of the i -Corps program. As I've told Dr. Shresh before, I strongly believe that this program embodies the NSF's original mission of both promoting the progress of science and advancing the national prosperity. Let's not forget that second part, especially when we're looking to maximize the efficiency of our federal investments. Although it's only one quarter of one percent of NSF's budget, I think this program will yield disproportionate benefits, helping turn NSF's research investments into jobs and encouraging both scientists and universities to push their work outside the ivory tower to the immediate benefit of all Americans. For my colleagues who haven't looked at this program in depth, it's important to note that we are talking about a stage of commercialization well before private sector financing gets involved. The goal of i -Corps is to educate scientists to help them establish the viability of an idea even before forming a new small business. Last month, I was able to meet with Steve Blank at Stanford to learn more about his implementation of this innovative potentially game-changing program. I look forward to working with the NSF as this program is expanded and improved. 
Second, I'm pleased that for the first time in many years, we're seeing growth in the education budget, similar to that in the research budget. We will disagree over some of the particulars in the EHR request, including the 22% cut to informal STEM education programs and flat funding for the NOICE scholarships. But I think the overall increase is a well-earned vote of confidence in the current leadership of EHR. There are many other interesting proposals in this budget request, including the increased focus on advanced manufacturing research, research that I called for in competes, the secure and trustworthy cyberspace initiative that is another priority issue for me, and the joint effort between NSF and the Department of Education on math education. It's good to see that the request would also put all the MREFC projects back on track after a couple years of significant cuts. I do, I do have some concern about the administration's proposal to hold NSF's operating budget flat. That seems like an odd place to start when in every other re year in recent memory, the agency has expressed concern about how thinly its staff has been stretched after Congress has flatlined the ops budget. In closing, I have to say that the increase in the budget request makes it easier for you to dream big and for me to offer mostly positive comments. But unfortunately, I think it's unlikely that Congress will be able to match your request when we eventually pass a budget. As I indicated at the outset, I believe that strong and sustained investments in the NSF, STEM education, and innovation generally are critical for our nation's future. My colleagues in Congress have, on a bipartisan basis, historically agreed with me. And I hope that will continue to be the case. I think this type of investment is critical to the future growth of our country. We cannot allow this to, to fall to, to the wayside. I thank uh, both of you for Dr. Shresh and Dr. Bowen for your work. I look forward to your, your testimony and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lipinski. If there are members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record at this point. Uh, at this time, I would like to introduce our witnesses for today's hearing. Uh, Dr. Subra Suresh was nominated by President Obama and unanimously confirmed by the United States Senate as the director of the National Science Foundation in September 2010. Prior to assuming his current role, Dr. Suresh served as the Dean of the School of Engineering and the Vannevar Bush Professor of Engineering at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, Dr. Ray Bowen was appointed to the National Science Board in 2002 and reappointed in 2008. He was elected chairman in 2010. Prior to joining the NSB, he served as president of Texas A&M and is currently president emeritus and professor emeritus of mechanical engineering. Dr. Bowen is also a distinguished visiting professor at Rice University. As our witnesses should know, spoken testimony is limited to five minutes each, after which members of the committee will have five minutes each to ask questions. I now recognize our first witness, Dr. Subra Suresh. Uh, Dr. Suresh, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Brooks, Ranking Member Lipinski, and members of the subcommittee, it's my privilege to be here with you today to discuss the National Science Foundation's fiscal year 2013 budget request. Today, science and technology are the new frontiers of American prosperity. The nation's well-being and global competitiveness depend more than ever before on the steady stream of new ideas and highly skilled science, technology, engineering, and mathematical talent that the National Science Foundation supports, and particularly the young researchers that NSF so skillfully nurtures. NSF supports the full breadth of science and engineering research and education. We seek emerging ideas with the potential to transform the world, establish new paradigms, and foster new industries. NSF has helped to make the U.S. an undisputed world leader in science, technology, and innovation. Our universities rank among the best in the world. Our scientists and engineers have led the world in discovery and innovation. 
Our transformative discoveries have created a vibrant private sector and great jobs. Worldwide, frontier research and technological innovation, driven by creative and skilled science and engineering workforce, are the new engines of economic growth. Science and technology are improving the prospects of eco for economic prosperity and a rising standard of living around the globe. It is a measure of our success that other nations are emulating the NSF model. The US can both be a partner and a leader in this global enterprise. The NSF budget request moves America forward by connecting the science and engineering enterprise with benefits for Americans in areas critical to job creation, a growing economy, and a higher standard of living. The administration and Congress have conveyed their clear determination to build on the nation's history of success in, in leading edge discovery and innovation. That is, un, that is the unmistakable message of the President's 2013 budget request for NSF of $7.373 billion, an increase of 4.8%. Bipartisan congressional support for the 2.5% increase in our 2012 budget reinforces that message. NSF has identified critical funding priorities that will provide long-term benefits for the nation. As good stewards of the public trust, we have also made tough choices to reduce and eliminate lower priority programs, identified opportunities to leverage resources for maximum impact, and held the line on NSF's operating expenses. This budget presents a well-targeted portfolio of innovative investments that provides increased support for fundamental research in all fields of science and engineering. This core research, which constitutes the largest share of NSF expenditures, lays the foundation for progress in science and technology and enhances our ability to address emerging challenges. NSF investments in advanced manufacturing, clean energy technologies, cybersecurity, and STEM education will support the administration's government-wide priorities in these critical areas. In 2013, NSF will support the cross-agency advanced manufacturing, national robotics, and materials genome initiatives by investing in research that makes manufacturing faster, cheaper, and smarter. Working in concert with other federal agencies, NSF will advance research to ensure that the nation's computer and networking infrastructure are secure and reliable, and to support a cybersecurity workforce. NSF will support clean energy research as a component of an initiative to address national challenges in environmental sustainability. The administration's new K-12 mathematics education initiative combines NSF's expertise in mathematics education research with the Department of Education's ability to scale up successful programs at state and local levels. NSF's larger suite of educational investments builds on the recognition that science and engineering talent is the foundation of America's future. Areas of educational investments span early learning to college completion. NSF brings its strength in supporting fundamental research and education to each of these broad areas of collaboration. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, I hope my testimony conveys the Foundation's vital role in ensuring that America remains at the epicenter in research, innovation, and learning that is driving 21st century economies. More than ever, the future prosperity and well-being of Americans depend on sustained investments in our science and technology. I'll be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Suresh. I now recognize our second witness, Dr. Bowen, for five minutes. Chairman Brooks, <clears throat> Ranking Member Lipinski, and members of the subcommittee, I appreciate the opportunity to testify before you today in support of the National Science Foundation budget request for fiscal year 2013. 
I'm Ray Bowen, Chairman of the National Science Board and President Emeritus of Texas A&M University. I'm also a distinguished visiting professor at Rice University. Before I begin my testimony, I'd like to take a short moment to say a few words about the board's working relationship with the NSF senior management. Over the past year and a half, the board has had the pleasure of work, working with our new director, Super Suresh. Dr. Suresh has brought fresh ideas to the foundation, uh, many of which are incorporated into the budget request before you. Board members appreciate having immediate access to the director and all of his staff, and as a result, we developed a close working relationship. With the board members representing the science, engineering, and education community around our country, we think this collaborative relationship is serving our nation well. My testimony today will emphasize a growing concern of the board concerning the nation's science and, and technology enterprise. The board has a 40-year-plus history of investigating indicators that drive innovation and discovery through its biannual report to the Congress and the President called Science and Engineering Indicators. These studies have documented the critical nature of science and technology investments to America's long-term economic growth and quality of life. In the recent re recently released Science and Engineering Indicators 2012, the R&D capacity trends demonstrate that nations worldwide are relying on innovation to drive progress. The data indicate that the United States remains a global leader in supporting science and technology research and development. But other, but other countries are now heavily investing in science and technology, having realized the, the significant returns. As reported in the indicators 2012, the United States has lost 28% of its high technology manufacturing jobs over the last decade. The economic recession in 2001 and 2008 and more efficient manufacturing processes have no, no doubt contributed to this decline. But other contributing factors include the growth of foreign investments in research and development and the resulting increase in foreign research, foreign research and development capacity. While the U.S. remains the overall world leader in high technology manufacturing, this lead is shrinking. The NSF budget request for FY 2013 reflects a clear understanding that investments in science, technology, and education are critical investments that will continue to build America far into the future. For other budget requests before you today, one specific area I'd like to highlight, and that is the Foundation's Agency Operations and Award Management Account. The AOAM account provides a fundamental framework through which the Foundation's science and engineering research and education programs are administered. AOAM funding covers NSF's scientific, professional, and administrative workforce, the physical and technological infrastructure necessary for a productive work environment, and the essential business operations critical to efficiently managing NSF's administrative processes. To sustain its excellence and, and its efficient management, the board fully ur urges full funding of the, of the NSF's AOAM account. Over its 60-year-plus its history, NSF's investments have underwritten a wealth of research that has directly and indirectly benefited the American economy and the general public, much, much of which remain, there is much that remains to be done. I understand that investments in science and technology compete with a host of other deserving funding priorities. Though it might be tempting to forego the long-term investments in the face of short-term challenges, Neglecting the scientific, re scientific research and education now may have serious consequences to our country as the data gathered from our indicators report illustrates. On behalf of the Science Board and, uh, and the STEM research and education communities, I'd like to thank members of this subcommittee for your long-term support of the National Science Foundation. We look forward to continuing that long-term relationship. Thank you. I thank the panel for their testimony, reminding members that committee rules limit questioning to five minutes. Uh, the chair at this point will open the round of questions. Uh, normally the chair would recognize himself for the first five minutes, but in this instance I'm going to swap times with uh, Mr. Holtgren from the great state of Illinois. Thank you so much, Chairman, and thank you both for being here. really appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Bowen, just wanted to start out. I've got several questions for both of you, so I wanted to go through some things kind of quickly. You testify that the growth of foreign investment in R&D and resulting increase in foreign R&D capacity are uh, contributing factors to the loss of 28% of domestic high-technology manufacturing jobs over the last decade. 
Would you agree that there are some other contributing factors, many of which uh, may be more critical uh, of the loss of manufacturing jobs or any jobs for that matter overseas? And wondered, uh, R&D spending aside, what do you think is the major obstacle to American competitiveness today? There are many factors, and it's much more complicated than my short statement would, would, would summarize. Uh, I come from a world where we invest a, a tremendous amount of confidence in a nation's ability to respond with innovation, given the fundamental investments in basic science. Uh, it's a long-term situation, and I realize there are short-term issues that need, that need to be addressed. Uh, <laughs> I would make a, a plea for the support for the long-term basic research. I think it will pay off uh, to our nation. Well, I agree with you. I'm a, I'm a huge supporter of basic scientific research. I feel, I feel like if we fail to do that, uh, we absolutely are failing our future uh, as we do that. Dr. Shirash, I uh, wonder if I could ask you, NSF has been identified as the only federal agency dedicated to the support of basic research, as we're talking about, and education in all fields of science and engineering. Do you believe that uh, some of the more applied areas of research identified in America Competes Reauthorization Act, coupled with uh, multiple administration applied priorities for NSF for uh, fiscal year 13 budget request, dilutes the funding for basic fundamental research? And I wonder if you could please explain. And uh, also, Dr. Bowen would love to get your thoughts on that as well. So, I, as, uh, um, as you pointed out, Mr. Hultgren, um, NSF funds. NSF focuses primarily on basic science and engineering, but uh, we also walk a very fine line between fun, uh, supporting core research, fundamental research, and research that may have um, a particular application where we provide basic knowledge, basic tools, basic technologies. A very good example is robotics. So if you take the National Robotics Initiative with about $70 million or so per year, NSF's investment is about $28 million, $28 million on an annual basis. And that investment goes from, um, from um, pure mathematics to computer science to optimization to social and behavioral sciences, human-machine interactions. So there are a variety of fundamental uh, tools, processes, and technologies, and basic understanding that uh, uh, National Robotics Initiative at NSF fosters. So that's a very good example of an interplay between basic research and what may seem like an applied area. Another example that I would like to point out, going back to your first question to Dr. Bowen, uh, in the 1970s, NSF funded mathematical and process modeling, which at that time was viewed by even some of the mission agencies and industries as too academic. And that support in the 1970s led to what we now know as rapid prototyping, which had a huge impact on American leadership in manufacturing in the 80s and 90s. So I think at, at NSF, the, the boundaries are blurred between um, the continuum of basic research all the way to what may evolve to be a spectacular innovation. I could just add a, a small footnote to this. Uh, you asked very specifically, did, I, did we think that the uh, applied research investments are in some sense competitive. I, I like to say no because I, I think that they play well together and reinforce each other. Uh, there are compromises and challenges in the budget that, that all of us understand. The one benefit of the basic research, which uh, we, we celebrate in my life the, the, as a university professor, is the creation of the human resource, the young people that are going to invest long careers, both in applied as well as, as fundamental kinds of activity. So I, again, would support that as well. And my fear is, again, that we're diluting that priority of basic scientific research that uh, all of us are talking of how important that is. One last question. Uh, Dr. Shuresh, you described the new I-Corp uh, initiative as a public-private partnership to accelerate the movement of research results from the lab to the marketplace by establishing opportunities to assess the readiness of emerging technology concepts for transition into the valuable new products are into valuable new products. Please walk us through i uh, specifically how awardees are selected, how you avoid picking winners and losers, which is something I'm very concerned about, uh, and perhaps most importantly, how this program falls within the basic research mission of the foundation. Um, I'll be very happy to answer that, uh, Mr. Hultgren. Um, NSF supports $6 billion a year, approximately, of basic research every year. And it's our 
desire and our mission not to deviate from that, uh, from that goal. So having said that, NSF historically, going back to the 1970s, has taken the product or the output of fundamental research and then ex extracted out of that the maximum value. A very good example is the SBIR program. NSF was the first federal agency to start an SBIR program. Now there are nine federal agencies to do that. What we do in the i -Corps is um, at the end of or at the end of an NSF funded project or very near the end of an NSF funded project, we ask the community to provide ideas on how to take the output of NSF funded fundamental research, the basic discovery, and by giving the, the principal investigators a small amount of money over a short period of time, ask them, does this basic discovery has, have the opportunity to go beyond publication, beyond a patent, uh, perhaps uh, to lead to a product, a process, a software, a tool uh, that can have near-term or long-term benefit to the society? And as um, I think uh, the ranking member just mentioned, um, the i -Corps budget by design is a tiny, tiny fraction of NSF budget. And i -Corps comes well before the foundation of a small business. So it's even more academic, more pre-business than SPIR. So it's well before the valley of death and what we call a ditch of death where ideas may not see the light of day because there is no opportunity. So that's the first goal of i -Corps. We do, it's absolutely not our intention to pick winners and losers. Uh, i -Corps does business the same way NSF does business. We want to fund the best ideas and the best people in the most transparent way through a gold standard peer review process. And that's what i uh, will continue to do. The, the, in the first round, we funded 21 programs, and all initial indications are a, a good subset of those programs will, uh, will go much beyond what i -Corps had intended. So we are very pleased with the initial indications. The other idea of i -Corps is um, the vast majority of NSF-funded institutions in the country at the present time, either because of their geographical location or because of the lack of infrastructure, are not part of the innovation ecosystem of the country. They probably are isolated. Uh, they may not have the um, uh, innovation infrastructure in their institutions. They may not have access to venture capitalists. Given that NSF in 2013 will support 285,000 individuals in the country to the tune of $6 billion, and we touch nearly 2,000 institutions in the country, we have an opportunity to use our stature, our reach, our scope to create a virtual infrastructure that brings together not only academics, but also industry leaders, people who have had spectacular successes um, through innovation, and equally people who have failed so that we can learn lessons from them. So, and I believe that innovation is a contact sport, and by bringing um, our NSF-funded community, including students, uh, in touch with this national ecosystem, we believe that we can extract much more value out of NSF investments into basic science and engineering. Well, again, I thank you both for being here. Uh, we just want to continue to work together, again, to have that focus of protecting, and I, I, I hear it from both of you, protecting that commitment to basic scientific research, especially in a time where the dollars are so tight to make sure that the priority is still there. So thank you. Chairman, thank you so much for your graciousness, too, and allowing me to go over and allowing me to go first. So thank you so much. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Holtgren. The chair now recognizes Mr. Lipinski of the great state of Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think there must be something in the water there because the same uh, two topics, manufacturing and i -Corps, that uh, Mr. Holcren had asked about. I also want to uh, ask some, some questions on, but I want to start with i -Corps, and uh, perhaps this is a, uh, an area that the chairman would consider having a, uh, a hearing on uh, so we can all learn more about what the i -Corps program is and, what's, and what the i -Corps program is doing, and I, I think the key uh, Dr. Shresh, you had uh, your experience with the Shpande Center at, at MIT, and I, for me, one of the bottom lines with this is we have a lot of people doing great research with, you know, NSF funding ac across the country, and uh, they're not always, um, scientists are not always the best at um, knowing how to uh, 
take those ideas and create a business. And uh, I think that's what i is, uh, is is trying to do, to help them to be able to, to do that, give them the, uh, the education, the, the contacts uh, to be able to do that. And I think it's a uh, really, as I said, potentially game-changing program. I, I just want to ask to briefly if Dr. Shresh, you could talk a little bit about how you're going to uh, expand this program, including wh where does private uh, funding come into this, private investment, uh, since this is public-private? Thank, thank you, Dr. Lipinski. Uh, uh, so in, in the initial, we, we wanted to start small, and we wanted to smart, uh, st start with uh, very small investments and a small cohort of uh, funded projects uh, last year. Uh, last summer, and the initial uh, private engagement came from two nonprofit foundations. One is that you mentioned the Deshpande Center of Massachusetts, Deshpande Foundation of Massachusetts, and the other one is the Kaufman Foundation of Kansas City. The Kaufman Foundation, as you know, and, and the Deshpande Foundation have uh, have a lot of experience in this space, and um, uh, our idea would be to take the best practices of um, uh, going from fundamental scientific discoveries to still staying in the technology development regime, not going to the business side, but within that space, try to identify how the ideas can move beyond a, a publication or basic discovery. Uh, so intentionally, we have put in about uh, $50,000 initial awards. Uh, the initial, for the first 12 months, our goal is to fund about uh, 100 projects or so. So we announced 21 projects early on and using the rapid mechanism so that we can identify them very quickly. Um, uh, rapid mechanism is a mechanism that NSF has used effectively uh, for, for quite some time. And uh, we'll have a second cohort of about 25 projects that will be announced before too long. So, so that's one, one part of it. The other part is uh, at steady state, we would like to have regional nodes of institutions that engage, that not only provide their expertise to the i project as a virtual national network, they will also help support other institutions. A third part of the i um, mechanism is to develop a national cohort of mentors, maybe about 100 mentors or so, who will be regionally distributed and also distributed in terms of their technological expertise, and they will play a mentoring role to especially young faculty members at universities across the country. Uh, the fourth component of this is uh, that we will, using NSF's um, um, reach across the country and, uh, and history and visibility, we would hope to bring NSF PIs in contact with leaders in industry, including small businesses from around the country. We have a variety of programs at NSF, the SPIR program, engineering research centers, IUCRCs, partnership for innovation. So all these programs can be leveraged to, uh, to, to enhance the potential success of uh, uh, i -Corps. Last but not least, one of the components of i is also an educational experience. So we have, uh, um, as, um, as you mentioned, uh, NSF funded a center on innovation, uh, especially at the undergraduate level, uh, teaching entrepreneurship at Stanford University. And we have started initially with uh, that mechanism uh, to provide instructional um, opportunities, educational opportunities for i grantees uh, to, to learn more about what it takes to go beyond uh, just development of technology, how to pay attention to other factors that are critically important for the success of their innovation. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shresh, and I, uh, in, well, I'm actually out of time now. I just want to say I think the great potential for this being a, uh, I -Corps being a feeder for NSF's SBIR program, SBIR program is definitely, uh, definitely a uh, great possibility. With that, uh, I'll yield back. Maybe we'll have a second round of questions. I can get Dr. Bowen the advanced uh, manufacturing. Uh, certainly, Mr. Lupinski, uh, time permitting, uh, we will do that. Um, let me now at this point go into the chairman's comments and questions. Uh, I want to emphasize that I have the highest degree of uh, confidence in both Dr. Suresh uh, having visited the NSF, uh, Dr. Bowen, uh, in your desire to further basic research and in America's intellectual capacity in that regard. At the same time, I have to temper that somewhat, though, with the very difficult financial condition our country is in. Um, 
I have a, a background in economics, and I want to assure you that if we continue as a country on this path, uh, there is 100 percent certainty that we will uh, face a national insolvency and bankruptcy. Uh, hence, we've got to do everything we can to change the path that we are on. You've seen what go is going on in Athens, uh, Greece, uh, and Italy, and other nations around the world who are more advanced towards uh, this insolvency uh, than we are. And so everything we do has to be tempered in that regard. Uh, to give you an idea of the risk to the National Science Foundation, which again I hold in very high regard, uh, should there be this insolvency and uh, bankruptcy, worst case scenario, uh, you all would be zeroed out because the federal government simply would not have the funds uh, if other items, uh, national defense, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, ended up being the highest priorities of the federal government. If just your share of the deficit um, were imposed on you, that would mean a cut of 36 percent in National uh, Science Foundation funding. That is definitely not a good thing for the progress of our country. Uh, if I were in charge, and I'm not, I'm one person on a, you know, a little pawn on a very large uh, chessboard, as seemingly most freshman congressmen are, uh, you know, I would look at things like foreign aid. Um, it's nice to help your friends and neighbors around the world, but at the same time, you have to get your own financial house in order. And I mentioned this just as an example of priorities. But direct and indirect foreign aid is, is in excess of $60 billion. That's almost 10 times what we spend on productive things like the National Science Foundation. And I use that um, uh, as a comparison point. So if I were in charge and able to cut elsewhere and reprioritize, uh, I would be mildly surprised that you're asking only 4.8 percent increase in your budget. I would certainly uh, strive for more, particularly in the context of the international competition that we face uh, with basic research and how some of our competitor nations are seeking to strive uh, to be in front of the United States of America on technological advances. Uh, certainly I say that with the community I coming from, uh, come from as a, a background item. I'm from Huntsville, Alabama, where we have a very high concentration of engineers, PhDs, scientists, mathematicians, physicists, uh, you name it. Uh, Huntsville uh, basically being the birthplace of America's space program. And also, if you're familiar with the gee whiz bang uh, high tech weaponry you see uh, on TV when we're engaged in conflicts around the world, where most of those are born or created or contracted for out of Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, so, uh, we understand in my community the importance of uh, basic research and the value thereof. Uh, that having all been said, um, Dr. Suresh, this question is for you. I applaud the foundation for identifying programs for consolidation or elimination totaling $67 million. However, that is less than 1 percent of your current budget. Given our current economic situation and when your budget request is asking for an almost 5 percent increase, are there other programs that are ripe for elimination, consolidation, or reduction? Uh, what steps is the foundation taking to make these fiscally responsible changes? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your question. NSF operates with NSF is a $7 billion agency with an overhead of 6 percent. So an extremely lean, lean organization. If we cut any more uh, in this organization, it will go from lean to anorexic. And I think we run the danger of that. So that's the first point I would like to make. The second point you've heard not just from me before, but uh, from my predecessors, previous directors of NSF, repeatedly, that um, NSF um, um, staff are extremely overworked at a time when the proposal pressure is very large. Last year, we handled in excess of 55,000 proposals. And uh, given that extreme overload, we managed to not only handle this and keep NSF and the scientific community at the forefront uh, without any increase in workforce. In fact, uh, even though we, we have had cuts of $67 million, it's been extremely painful for us to, to see that we have to hold the line on AOAM uh, budget for FY13. That effectively reflects a cut in our budget, especially at a time um, our staff are overworked. As uh, Dr. Bowen mentioned, it's a very important item that's the backbone of all our activities. So we have taken great pains to go through the budget very, very carefully, put investments in areas where we can keep the American scientific enterprise and the workforce at the forefront, 
while trying to be as fiscally responsible as possible. And uh, so, so this, is, uh, uh, this budget reflects, uh, reflects that, uh, uh, that sentiment. Thank you, Dr. Suresh. I would encourage you to uh, continue to examine uh, the NSF uh, expenditures to see if there are any other duplications or waste uh, that can be ascertained, again, in light of the budget circumstances we face. Uh, I, I see I'm over time, but in as much as I'm going to allow others to have second rounds of questions, I'm going to ask one more before I defer to the next uh, congressman. Uh, Dr. Bowen, as I mentioned, Congress is faced with many difficult funding decisions in our current economic situation. Every committee is hearing similar pleas from education to transport transportation and from energy to defense. Federal funding cuts are likely a reality over the next few years. How would you suggest we look at reining in government expenditures across the board, and how do we prioritize programmatic funding for the foundation? Thank you. <clears throat> Your question has, uh, has broad dimensions, and it's a complicated one. It's one that we on the Science Board uh, discuss among ourselves frequently. We're very pleased that the, in the year and a half that Dr. Suresh has been our director that he came on board addressing that same kind of concern, and he's looking seriously across the foundation at all, all of its programs trying to set priorities. Uh, we're in, in some measure, while $7 billion is a huge amount of money, we're a small activity, and we think, in fact, we produce a large result. There are major, major positive consequences of the kinds of investments that we've been allowed to make throughout our history. So we would always plead that we, we be allowed to continue that. But if it were to be the case that we had to come back with a more difficult budget situation than, than currently is present, uh, the foundation and the board itself would work diligently to sort of set those priorities, and we'd be reinforcing their already serious background work our director and his senior staff have done. I don't have the, the simple solution in terms of the shape that might actually take, but in fact, you, you can depend on full cooperation and, and energy of the board to, to work with the foundation to achieve whatever uh, parameters are set for us in terms of our budget. Thank you, Dr. Bowen. At this time, the chair recognizes uh, Mr. Tomko of New York. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Dr. Suresh, for uh, many students, community colleges are the gateway to um, higher education, uh, affording them the most, of, uh, uh, the greatest opportunity economically for that stretching of their education uh, career. And community colleges uh, then also provide them that step to the, uh, the four-year university. Um, they've also had a long history of training and retraining people to allow them to upgrade uh, their job skills. Which of the NSF education initiatives uh, provide support for our community colleges? There are a number of activities that, uh, that we have, but one of the programs that specifically targets community colleges is the ATE program with a, with a request, budget request in 2013 of uh, $64 million. ATE stands for Advanced Technological Education. And um, uh, so, so that's one uh, program that I want to mention. The other broader program is the EPSCOR program, because in many of the EPSCOR states, perhaps uh, community colleges are uh, more of a gateway to the educational enterprise for the citizens. Uh, that's another vehicle that, uh, that we have. So those are two examples that I can give you. Now, the, the NSF Innovation Corps program sounds similar to the mission of the Small Business Innovative Research Program. SBIR. Can you discuss the relationship between the two programs so that we can better understand the separate issues they're designed to address? I'll be happy to. The Innovation Core program is designed in a space that comes way before a small business is formed. So our goal would be the, the Innovation Core program um, uh, solicitation will address those projects that have just completed or about, that are about to complete an NSF-funded basic research effort. So we give them a very small amount of money, something on the order of about $50,000 and six months, and ask them uh, to look at what is, the, uh, what is the potential for the basic discovery to go beyond uh, just, just a basic discovery. And uh, this comes way before SBIR. So our hope would be one of the metrics of success for the I Innovation Core would be that many of the I-Core projects 
would matriculate to an uh, SBIR application, not just at NSF, but even at other, f other federal agencies. Maybe they'll receive VC funding or some other venue. So that's, that's one of the goals. So um, the innovation core is much more towards basic research than the SBIR program. Okay, and then when you talk about research, I noted that NSF has allocated like $300 million toward clean energy research. Um, and I'm pleased to see our president is focusing on efficiency and clean energy because, in my opinion, energy efficiency ought to be our field of choice. So where can you tell us how you're coordinating with the Department of Energy on these research programs as they relate to clean energy? So we, we have uh, frequent conversations, not just with Department of Energy, with, uh, with, with uh, other federal agencies. There are a number of mechanisms uh, that we have. Um, one vehicle is uh, through the initiatives in which we co-fund. Um, we have frequent conversations. Our program officers um, have uh, uh, a lot of uh, frequent contact with program officers from our sister agencies in Washington. The other mechanism we have is the National Science and Technology Council. So I co-chair, along with Dr. Francis Collins from uh, NIH and Dr. Carl Wyman from OSTP, the Committee on Science. The Committee on Science is a forum uh, that brings together principles from uh, many different agencies uh, in Washington. And that's another vehicle where we compare notes. Uh, with respect to clean energy in the NSF context, there is always a basic research uh, primarily a basic research component to this. Clean energy could mean for us, uh, for example, uh, new materials to design uh, um, a, a, a panel for a solar energy, or it could be f uh, new material for solar cells. Um, it, it could involve new engineering models uh, to understand fluid mechanics, whether it's uh, wind or water and so forth. So NSF's focus is always um, uh, basic science, even in the clean energy context. One other point I would like to make is the NSF is unique in that it supports all fields of science and engineering. So as an agency, we are uniquely positioned, especially in the energy space, to bring in perspectives from social, behavioral, and economic sciences to bear on perspectives from natural sciences. And that interplay is very unique and very important. And NSF plays a very critical role, and this is something that we have talked to our, our colleagues in the Department of Energy about how we can collaborate. Thank you, Dr. Suresh, and I believe I'm out of time, so thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Tomko. Uh, the Chair next recognizes the Chairman of the Science, Space, and Technology Committee, uh, Mr. Hall, for remarks. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I'll be very brief because I don't know what remarks have been made or answers given, but uh, I just want to thank you uh, and for whoever selected these two gentlemen here. That uh, It's the best job of selecting I've known in a long, long time. I know to have the director of the National Science Foundation here, and I thank you for your recent letter of support. And of course, for uh, Ray Bowen, I've known him and known of him forever. Uh, and that's a long time for a guy like me. But uh, he was president of Texas A&M, and he's now associated with Rice University. I probably. I could have got in A&M, might have, could have got out, but I couldn't even get in Rice University. But you do a good job for us, and you represent us well, and thank you for all you've done for our state and for education and for the nation. Mr. Chairman, thank you for letting me do that. I yield back. Certainly, Mr. Chairman, and we also want to welcome Texas A&M to the Conference of Football Champions, the SEC. We're working, on our, we're working on our linebacker situation as we speak. <laughs> Probably need to work on a lot more than that. <laughs> With that, I recognize a number uh, member from the family of the Southeastern Conference, uh, Mr. Plaza of Mississippi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Suresh, last year the budget request for science, engineering, and education for sustainability C's portfolio was $998 million. This year the request is $202.5 million. The fiscal year 12 request estimated spending on C's for fiscal year 11 to be 660 million. Uh, the fiscal year 13 request reflects fiscal year 11 actual spending to be 87.96 million or 572 million less than the estimated in the previous year. I know that's a lot of numbers. Uh, hopefully you followed it. Last year the program's mission was to advance climate energy science 
engineering and education to inform the societal actions needed for environmental, economic sustainability and sustainable human well-being. For fiscal year 13, you described the program as having a targeted mission to promote innovative interdisciplinary research to address pressing societal issues of clean energy and sustainability. I do not believe climate change appears anywhere in the fiscal year 13 budget request relative to the C's portfolio. While I can assure you that I would be very pleased to see the Foundation make such a fiscally responsible decision by reducing requested spending on these activities by more than half a billion dollars, I am certain this is probably not the case. Could you please explain this drastic change for the C's portfolio and share with us how NSF is now capturing the funding for climate-related research? Thank you, Mr. Palazzo, for your question. So the C's portfolio that was originally proposed in the FY12 budget request to Congress, of course, was predicated upon the assumption that uh, NSF budget for FY12 would be $7.8 billion. It turned out, as you know, to be about $7.03 billion. Sustainability is one of the major issues that we face as a, as a race, a uh, human race. And sustainability has many, many dimensions to this. We have rebaselined uh, the C's portfolio through very careful planning during the course of last year. In fact, the 2013 uh, budget request, request entails about a, 50, about a $46, $47 million increase over the 2012 current plan. And in the 2013 C's portfolio, we have uh, a variety of activities that will involve coastal regions, uh, the Arctic coastal regions. Um, we'll have uh, sustainable chemistry, uh, computational and cyber-enabled mechanisms to facilitate seas, uh, things like uh, ocean acidification, uh, rising sea levels. So whether they are explicitly or in implicitly linked to uh, climate change or not, these are issues that involve uh, societal uh, global change. And it's very important that we understand the science engineering and education related to sustainability. So the re-baseline budget for C's for 2013 is uh, $202 million, as you had indicated. I'm, I may be stepping off here. Uh, are you familiar with the Restore Act? Uh, you're probably familiar with the, uh, oil, the, the BP oil spill from about two years ago this April. Uh, the uh, the president or the secretary of the Navy actually led up an effort on, in that regards to basically from all the pollution and penalty money that 80 percent of that should be returned back to the Gulf states that were affected uh, due to the oil spill. And I know the NSF and you're talking about sustainability and, and things of this nature of the oceans. Um, the Gulf of Mexico is probably one of the most overlooked bodies of water but one of the most um, tremendous in what it returns to our nation in terms of oil and gas production as well as some of the best seafood in the world. Um, I think we produce over one third of it uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. Do you, um, do you think that's a, a good thing is to take the 80 percent and push it? I mean, the Secretary of the uh, Navy said that several reports, conservationists, environmentalists, and others uh, would like to see this happen. I mean, you've never seen people on the left and the right support a bill to return uh, not taxpayer funds but penalty money back to the Gulf Coast region so they can begin their long-term economic and environmental recovery. Just any thoughts on that? Have you been following it? And, um, would you agree that that's probably a better use of the money instead of coming up here to the U.S. Treasury and disappearing? Well, first of all, let me, let me say, Congressman Palazzo, that uh, when the Gulf oil spill took place, NSF was there immediately. In fact, uh, we assisted. We had rapid um, funding mechanisms uh, to make sure that uh, American scientists had an opportunity to go right to the, right to the Gulf and uh, help with their perspectives, their viewpoints, and also giving them an opportunity to gather scientific data so we can understand uh, not only how this oil spill took place, what its implications are with respect to the coastal region, environment, and the people, and people's livelihoods, but also uh, to understand things better so that in the future, if something like this were to happen anywhere else, we are much better prepared as, as a nation. We also provided resources, our Geological Sciences Directorate, 
made sure that um, some of the key vessels and, uh, and uh, expertise were provided to the region. So NSF uh, takes a very active part uh, in this. We did the same thing when the tsunami struck uh, in Japan last year. We put in place a rapid mechanism uh, so that our scientists have, have an opportunity to understand this. Uh, regarding your question about how much of the money should go uh, in the Restore Act, I'm not an expert. It's in, in, unless you agree with me, you don't have to make a statement well, for the record. It's, so. it's, it's way above my pay grade, so Let's, thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you for allowing me to go over, and, and Dr. Sarish, thank you for the NSF's participation in studying the oil spill. I would just like to say that um, this is going to be decade. We're going to have to study this for a long, long time. Um, to find out the true environmental um, consequences. So thank you for allowing me. Thank you, Mr. Palazzo. Next, the chair recognizes Mr. Harris from the great state of Maryland. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Dr. Suresh and uh, um, Dr. Bowen for appearing before the subcommittee. Let me follow up a little bit with uh, from the gentleman from Mississippi here, uh, Dr. Suresh, because I I'm still wondering about this uh, SES program here which is supposed to uh, quote, adva advance, quote, the climate, energy, science, engineering, and education to inform the societal actions needed for environmental and economic sustainability and sustainable human well-being. What the heck is sustainable human well-being? I mean, are we, are we afraid that America is going to, you know, disappear into some economic vacuum, or so, I, I don't get it. So let me give a few examples of that. Uh, what we mean by that. Um, rising sea levels affecting sustainability of coastal regions and livelihoods is one example. Another example would be uh, tsunamis, disasters that, uh, how, do, how do we prepare? And one of the components of seas is uh, a, a program that looks, as, looks at a disaster resilient America. Um, and what kind of science, engineering, and educational tools that we need, an agency like NSF should support, uh, that will prepare uh, the, not only the scientific community, but our educational enterprise to address um, how do we plan in the face of risk, uh, unexpected events that take place, both natural and man-made events. Well, let's take, those, let's take those two, because I don't, I, I don't know, uh, what, what man-made events are you talking about? Uh, sustainability of urban env environment, uh, cities, okay. building in cities. That's a man-made uh, event. Okay, and uh, I'm not, I, I'm just not sure, I, I guess that's just wanders a little far from science for me, but you know, I, I could, the, for the first part of your answer, I could have been here in a NOAA hearing uh, where they justify their uh, climate programs. How, why, why should we fund multiple programs within the federal government that all appear in their testimony to be addressing exactly the same problem? At, at first sight, seemingly they may address the same thing, but NSF is unique in multiple respects. For example, we have um, modeling of risk uh, using computational and data-enabled science and engineering, basic science and engineering. Okay, so NSF me, funds to a huge Well, let me level. just go ahead. I only have th five minutes then. So the why should we fund NOAA? Well, if, NOAA, if NSF has all these wonderful things, why should we fund NOAA for today? We are not in the same business as NOAA. We don't do uh, weather prediction. We don't have the National Weather Service. We, don't, we, we collaborate with them on projects. There are projects where we are complementary to one another. We are not a mission agency. We, our, our mission is to foster basic science and engineering. So the output of what NSF funds directly benefits NOAA and vice versa. NOAA's uh, activities give us context and, and, uh, and, and issues and problems that we can work together. So I don't think it's an overlap of um, um, activities. It's more of a, um, what one feeds into another, and NSF is, is upstream with NOAA. Uh, there are other things we do. Uh, NSF funds the Antarctica program. We are the lead American agency to do this. We help NASA, we help NOAA, we help the U.S. Geological Survey to do their experiments there. We provide facilities there. They, again, it's not an overlap. It's not wasted effort. It's not a duplication. It's a very, very complementary effort. Okay. Uh, why, you know, the, I think your overall budget request is for 5% increase. Now, the other, you know, one of the other major, I would consider major science groups you, you, you compete with for money is the NIH. And my understanding is the budget was flat uh, level funded for NIH. Why should we give the NSF an increase in a time of budget 
stress, and I'll be gentle saying budget stress, when you know, another agency that has very valuable mission, the National Institutes of Health, is not getting a 5% increase. So I, can, I cannot speak for other agencies. As head of NSF, I can only speak for NSF. My good friend, uh, Francis Collins, uh, director of NIH, can justify the needs that NIH has. But I can say the following thing. NIH budget uh, more than doubled between the late 90s and early part of last decade. Uh, NSF budget, um, according to the America Competes Act, which was passed unanimously in the Senate, NSF budget was supposed to uh, increase and double, and obviously because of the financial situation we are in. Sure. What we, year did that, NS that Competes Act pass? 2007. What was the federal debt in 2007? Do you know? Because you probably run a lot of numbers. Well, I, uh, I, I know it's, uh, it's, it's a little, it was a was little it, less. Was it about half of what it is now? Probably, yes. Okay. So you don't expect us to make decisions based on an act necessarily six years when the entire fiscal climate of the country has changed? Uh, absolutely not. We are, we are yeah. very much aware of uh, the fact that uh, the financial constraints at the present time force us to make very tough choices. And one of the tough choices that we've made is... Uh, is only to have a budget increase of 5%. I've got to tell you, I, I just, and Mr. Chairman, I'm going to be done in a second. You know, America is tired of government folks coming up and saying that a budget increase of 5% is a tough choice, getting, a, getting an increase of 5%. That's what the president said in his budget. That's what you're saying in your budget. And I got to tell you, the American public who's out there paying 50 cents a gallon more for gas is an effective cut in their, in their family budget is upset at people coming in front of this Congress and saying a 5% increase in my budget is a tough choice. I, I yield back the balance of my time. Could I uh, provide a response to that, Mr. Chairman? Thank you, Mr. Harris. Uh, sure, the chair will recognize Dr. Shares to follow up. So I was, when I said tough choices, I was referring to the tough choices we had to make in our priorities. So let me mention a few things, um, uh, Mr. Harris, in response to your point. NSF has the, has the mandate not only to fund all fields of science and engineering, but also uh, supports human capital development. Since 1952, we have supported 48,000 graduate students in the country through NSF fellowships. They've been the engines of innovation in this country over the last many years. So it's not, so I, I can only quote uh, a, an example that Mr. Norm Augustine, who authored um, the America Competes Act, mentioned. He said, you know, if, if an aircraft has serious overweight issue, uh, we have to reduce weight. The first thing we don't want to throw out is the engine. And uh, I would like to point out that NSF is the innovation engine as an agency for the country. These are very difficult times. We are making very difficult choices in programs priorities. Our funding rate for proposals is less, is 20% this year. We have many, many more uh, wonderful ideas from Americans uh, that we are not able to fund because of the budget climate. At a time when we have competition from around the world, China's annual, annual increase in research funding from 1996 to 2007 is 22%. Ours was 6.4%. We are the last among well-developed countries uh, to fund this. We were even below the European Union, which has, which has had an annual increase above the U.S. between 1996 and 2007. So this is, this is the context in which we have to look at the NSF budget request. Mr. Harris, did you want any other follow-up response? Only a comment, Mr. Chairman. The EU, you're right, the EU probably spent more. Uh, just yesterday, Greece was declared in default. They didn't make the tough choices. I'm afraid we're not making tough choices. I just, Ms. Dr. Suresh, the American public is not ready to hear that a 5% increase in a federal budget when we borrow $1.2 trillion next year, including from the Chinese, is a tough choice. And I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Harris. The chair next recognizes uh, Mr. Lipinski for a second round of questions. Uh, if any other members wish to um, ask a second round or participate in a second round, please let the chair know. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Certainly, we do have um, 
tough choice to make. I'm very happy that for this, uh, the current fiscal year, that, that Congress did decide that uh, NSF was, uh, as we were cutting other things, NSF was worthy uh, because of the important investments we make for the country. And I hope that we will, again, on a bipartisan basis in Congress decide that that, that is the case. I wanted to uh, come back to uh, advanced manufacturing. And uh, I know in Dr. Bowen's testimony, you highlight the decline in high-tech manufacturing jobs in the United States in the state that we are falling alarmingly close to being overtaken by rapidly increasing Asian investments in knowledge and technology intensive industries to bolster their economies. Now, according to this year's S&E indicators, private businesses do 70 percent of the R&D in this country, more than two-thirds of which is done by the manufacturing sector. But just as we have seen manufacturing jobs move abroad over the last 30 years, we are now seeing the R&D sponsored by U.S.-based multinationals moving overseas as well. So both Dr. Bowen and uh, Dr. Shuresh, are there intrinsic advantages to co-locating industrial R&D and manufacturing? And are you worried that, uh, that this is happening and it's going to be troubling for uh, the future of manufacturing in our country? And what, uh, what could we do about that? Dr. Bowen? I'll make my comment short. I think Dr. Suresh probably has a greater depth of, of knowledge about, about this. It's very complicated. Uh, I believe, and I think the National Science Board believes, that these investments that we've talked about, to the extent the economy will allow it, the budget will allow it, produce a long time underpinning of our technical manufacturing capability. Near term, there are perhaps other issues, uh, policy issues, which could, which could drive that. Uh, but long term, the ability to, for, for our people to have a, a employment opportunities, for have the innovation that can be take, take place in our universities to be utilized and transferred into the, to the economy. Uh, I, I think the NSF role, investment in, in very basic fundamental research is, is a key piece of it. There are other pieces for which I'm perhaps not fully qualified to comment about. Dr. Um, uh, as Dr. As Dr. Bowen mentioned, it's, it's an extremely complex issue. Um, NSF's role comes in many different ways, uh, fostering uh, scientific work that leads to cutting edge tools, technologies, and processes. As, of course, that's, that's one part of it. Another part is through programs like Advanced Technological Education, which is uh, for community colleges, two-year community colleges, probably about 30 percent of that. Uh, would, would have implications for advanced manufacturing. This is an area where we are focusing on. In fact, uh, we'd like to talk to um, uh, other agencies to see how we can partner in new and unique ways. For example, the Department of Labor. Um, a third uh, potential avenue for us is uh, with, with the new um, proposal to have a manufacturing initiative that uh, uh, NIST, uh, Department of Energy, Department of Defense, and other agencies will lead I've had con conversations with my counterpart, heads of agencies, about how NSF could play a role in partnership with them in providing support for activities that further the, the um, uh, manufacturing enterprise for the country. So there are many different activities that we can focus on. Um, one of the ideas that has come up is uh, if other agencies, especially mission agencies and especially agencies like uh, DOD with uh, a lot of manufacturing base, uh, can create industry university partnerships in unique ways. NSF can play a role in uh, supporting that in innovative ways. There are ongoing discussions as recently as last week. But is co-locating a uh, an issue that if you're going to be doing uh, your research in uh, if you're going to be doing your manufacturing in an area, you want to have the, the research there and vice versa. Once if the research is uh, not going on here, that we're not going to have. The, uh, the manufacturing is going to lead to less manufacturing? I, I think it's very industry specific. I think it's very uh, uh, specific to the particular areas that we are dealing with. One recipe may not, may not fit all, but uh, we can look, look at examples of um, uh, institutions and countries that, uh, that are doing very well in this space. For example, in Germany, uh, you have uh, different uh, mechanisms. You have tracks for science-based or humanities-based undergraduate education. You have a se separate track for 
uh, technical education, and you have industries that are co-located, you, you have industries that are separated, uh, have diff manufacturing in a different place than where they have. The semiconductor industry is a good example. Even within the U.S., you take companies like Qualcomm. Qualcomm doesn't do chip manufacturing for uh, te telephones and, and mobile devices. They create innovation. They have a different business model, and it's a very successful company. Uh, compared to some other company uh, in the semiconductor industry that may have manufacturing coupled to R&D activities. So I think it, it, um, I'm, not, uh, uh, I'm not qualified from the industry perspective, especially for multiple industries, to say which, which is a better model, but there are different models that work successfully. Thank you. I see my, my time has expired. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Does any other member wish to engage in a second round of questions? Mr. Harris uh, of Maryland, you're recognized. Thank you very much. Okay, Dr. Suresh, I'm going to give you a chance to, <laughs> to make up for this. Um, what does the National Science, and what is the National Science Foundation doing to uh, literally help bring down the price of gas in the United States? I mean, are you partnering with DOE on you know geologic uh, science to make drilling more successful? Uh, to f make hydrofracturing more successful. Encourage me. Tell me there's something you're, you all are doing that the average American who uh, maybe is taking the time to pay attention to what's going on here today says, you know what, they know what I'm feeling right now. You know, 389 a gallon gas. They, they understand, and, and this administration is going to do something to bring down the cost of that gas. So convince me. Thank you, Congressman Harris, for giving me another chance to ask okay. a question. Uh, I wish it were as simple as saying that NSF's work today will lead to a dollar a gallon drop in gas prices tomorrow, but unfortunately, uh, I cannot claim that, uh, especially as a scientist, uh, I, we, we cannot do that. NSF's goal is to do cutting-edge research, and we have created programs like Innovation Core. Uh, the, the idea of Innovation Core, the SBIR program, all these programs that NSF fosters is to take cutting edge scientific discoveries and move them to useful products and tools that benefit society as quickly as possible. Our mandate is still, mandate from Congress, is still to foster basic science and engineering in all fields of science and engineering. That's the space in which we work. And if you look at historically in the last 40 years, NSF has produced results that have created whole new industries. I mentioned Qualcomm earlier. The founders of Qualcomm received NSF support. Dr. Suresh, I'm going to ask you to stay to oil, gas, coal, something that is bringing down the cost of energy to Americans at the pump today. Now, for instance, you know that hydrofracturing was a basic engineering, that concept was a basic engineering breakthrough. Did the NSF have anything to do with it? Because I know the President's claimed somehow the something the government did did something good for it. It was NSF involved. Uh, so NSF was involved in a, an entire field of study called fracture mechanics. In fact, I was a beneficiary of it. I had an NSF support from 1985 to 1990 where I published about 50 papers in the area of fracture mechanics. I, I, knew, you could, I knew we could see, see eye to eye on something. Now tell me, <laughs> tell me that we're doing something like that now, that we have not, in fact, neglected an entire field of energy research in search of a holy grail that we're not going to achieve. So tell me there's something besides solar and wind and something going on at the NSF that's actually practical to advance our standing in the world as energy producers using the natural resources of fossil fuels that we have here in the country? So NSF continues to support through the Engineering Directorate, through the Geological Sciences Directorate and other programs, activities that benefit hydraulic fracturing. Can you give me an example, concrete example? I, I'll be happy to. If you could. I, I, uh, I'll be happy I, to provide specific projects that, uh, that we fund. In the area of uh, seas, in clean energy activities, we have programs that support novel fuel cells, wind energy, solar energy, um, uh, across disciplines. So there are many, many ongoing activities at NSF that support all of this, which directly and indirectly, uh, some near term, some long term, uh, provide uh, opportunities to, to, far, uh, to move in the direction of energy sustainability. 
and, and NSF plays a key role in that. Well, let's talk a little about energy sustainability. I mean, because the sustainability word is important and it's emotionally charged. I mean, the data I've seen is that, you know, our no known natural gas reserves that we can produce, not even known reserves, are over 100 years. Now, that's pretty sustainable to me. So, again, is there an emphasis at NSF saying, okay, we, we're talking about sustainability. We now know that we have at least 100 years of natural gas that we could unlock. We, we, we do have technical difficulties. I'll admit, I mean, hydro, you know, the hydrofracturing technique is good. Every one of these techniques can get better. Again, is there an emphasis at the NSF, or is this part, or is the NSF engaging in the, what it seems to be an administration-wide effort to put our resources into every other single source of energy except fossil fuel? Or is the NSF, like the NIH, kind of step back and say, we're not letting politics play. This is science. This is not politics. Because I'll tell you, doctor, I'm kind of disappointed that you roll out solar stuff and, and fuel cell this, fuel cell that, and you can't give me a concrete example of a single project that NSF is funding right now that will make it easier, safer, better, cheaper to deliver fossil fuel to the American consumer, like gasoline. So we have projects in our materials division, division of materials research, for example, that look at new materials for drilling. We have uh, that pro project has been funded for many years through a variety of programs. That's an example. I, I, knew, we'd go, I knew we were going to see eye to eye eventually. If you <laughs> can get me that, I'd appreciate that, and I yield back. I'll, I'll be happy time. to give you a lot more examples. Thank you very, very much. Any other members who wish to go through a second round of questions? Seeing none, I thank the witnesses for their valuable testimony and the members for their questions. It's been a very lively and informative discussion. Uh, the members of the subcommittee may have additional questions for the witnesses, and we will ask you to respond to those in writing. The record will remain open for two weeks for additional comments from members. The witnesses are excused, and this hearing is adjourned.